All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this uh, session. Let's begin this time with a word of prayer. And we're getting to our study together. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you so much for this beautiful day, this beautiful time that you have blessed us with. Lord, thank you for your word that is eternal, that is powerful, that is sharper than a double-edged sword that penetrates each of our hearts, oh God. And your word brings life into our spirit. Maybe as we learn, oh God, about discipleship and small groups, oh God, this is your design, this is your heart for each of us, oh God, that we will raise up disciples and build your kingdom, Lord. Holy Spirit, we ask that you will minister, give us the grace, give us the wisdom to understand everything that you have to speak to us today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so last class, uh, we talked about chapter 25 and chapter 26, if I'm not wrong. Uh, I know that our in-person students were uh, not here, they were in Bangalore. Uh, but let me just do a quick review, uh, just in case those some of us who are, could not watch the video. Uh, uh, but I do encourage you to go back and watch the video so that you know you're, you're up to speed. OK, we last class, we did chapter 25. We looked at four important steps of uh, training cell members into leaders. We looked at develop relationships with the members. Right, you, If you want to speak into a person's life, you develop a relationship with them first. And only then you can speak into their lives. And we looked at developing ministers out of members so you build a relationship then you don't just leave it there you you take that relationship to the next step you develop them to become ministers now uh, you don't you know very important is you don't immediately give them titles right challenge them to take up ministry roles challenge them to pull in when it comes to leadership right uh, and then Step three, we talked about making the challenge. Even as you are opening up small opportunities for them, give them the opportunity, meaning a time will come when you make them, you know, you tell them, okay, now is the time you step up. You make the challenge for them. And Jesus did that so beautifully, right? He, I think it was probably about a year after his ministry. He said, okay, now you all go. And when you go out, you will do everything that I did, release them. So you make the challenge, help them to start their own group or help them to uh, take up that role of leadership. You know, many a times uh, people are afraid of this term leadership. Uh, not everyone, but some of them want it. Uh, some of them don't want it, right? they're, they're fearful. Like they say, oh, what if I become a leader and I'm not equipped enough? What if I make these mistakes? Or what if I'm not even a leader? Uh, what if that's not my calling? Uh, but it's very important to understand that you know sometimes you, many a times you give a person an opportunity, and then as they fulfill that role, they begin to understand. Hey, this is what this it becomes a comfort zone, and they understand that this is a calling that God has upon their lives, right? And sometimes if we don't give that opportunity, they just be in that same place, right? So one of the aspects in leadership is to get people out of their comfort zone, right? It's never to leave them in a place of comfort. If you look through the scriptures, all through the Old Testament, even in the New Testament, the prophets and leaders, everyone got people to come out of their comfort zone. Uh, it's a natural, right? That's how God works. Uh, step four, help them to start their group. Now, uh, these will involve practical steps, right? Uh, 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 you know, probably connecting with people, helping them, just being there at the background, uh, taking a step back and helping them to, you know, uh, start off the group. Uh, um, and remember that at a certain point, you can be there for them, right? Just encouraging them. But at a certain point, it's good to just step back and let them take the work forward. And we also looked at chapter 26, which is the leader as a coach. And a very important point that we talked about was coaches don't develop people. They equip people to develop themselves. And so uh, that's, again, a very, very important point. OK, uh, so uh, let's go into the next aspect, which is in chapter 27, mentoring another Christian. 
Uh, now, the moment you hear you and I hear the word mentoring, at least for me, the first thing that comes to my mind is a father and a son. In 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 the natural, uh, a father would like to mentor their son, right? A, a father keeps telling their child, "Okay, do this, do that, don't do this," because if you don't, if you do this, you'll be successful. If you don't do this, uh, you know you'll end up not being fruitful in life. So when you talk about mentoring, it is a wide subject. But there's some very important points that we're going to talk about today, right? And how you and I, as believers, no matter what phase of life we are in, right? We may be working in the marketplace. We may have our own business. We may be students. We may be... Uh, you know, just starting off in ministry, it doesn't matter. Wherever we are, we are called to mentor one another. Right? We, are all, we are all at different levels of in our spiritual world, but we're called to mentor each other. Right? So how, how, what, what are some of the important points? Mentoring is some of the ways that God deals with us. Second Corinthians 6, 18, I will be a father to you. And you will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. And if you look at the uh, the Old Testament, um, you, we have plenty of verses talking about God being a loving father, God dealing with the people uh, of Israel, especially, you know, even in their sin, uh, God dealing with them like a father. Right? He writes in Isaiah, he says, uh, I, I, I covered you under my wings, yet... You try to fly away when you are not ready. It's so wonderful to see uh, this father heart of, of, of God. Right? So how do we understand God's dealing with us? Very important is to understand that developing people is spiritual fathering and mentoring. Now, one of the things that we must avoid and something that we try to avoid in APC is that we avoid using the term he's my spiritual father or he's my spiritual mother. The there is a reason to it. Now, it's not that it's unbiblical. It is biblical. The principle is biblical. But sometimes this whole thing of spiritual father and spiritual mother is taken way out of context and can... Uh, really cause a lot of problems among the leaders. Uh, you know, we do talk about the principles of spiritual fathering and mothering. We we, we do that, right? Uh, and to understand that developing people from one level of maturity to another is called spiritual fathering or mothering. Developing people cannot just be a program, although we use a lot of programs. For example, we have something called as life skills that we just launched in the year 2023, uh, 2024, early 24 as well. We launched this life coaching, right? So for example, there'll be a person who is 20 years as a businessman, right? And then you've got a young person, maybe a young youth who's just completed his uh you know business management degree in business management and he wants to start his own business so he needs help what do i do how do i start off what should i do what should i what i shouldn't do and so life coaching comes in right where this person who has 20 years of experience has seen the market has seen has learned from his mistakes can speak into the life of this young boy or young girl right and what hap what's happening is that uh, that is mentoring that is happening, right? Now, again, this this could be spiritual. It could be even just things that are around, right? Uh, maybe business and anything else, any sphere of influence. Yet it is mentoring, right? Uh, so we can develop people, you, but it's not just a one day's event. We can't say we have a okay, conference morning 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Okay, now I have raised up spiritual sons and daughters. It doesn't work that way. We use programs to help them learn, but then they have to go back and 
you know, be able to apply what has been taught in their lives. And as a leader, you would have to go back and follow up and minister one on one when it, if you want to be a mentor, right? Care and love is the key. At the moment, uh, and we've talked a lot about this, right? Paul writes and he says, uh, he talks about the whole aspect of love. And if we do all of these things, which is wonderful, prophecy, word of knowledge, working of miracles, gifts of healing, we do all of it. And if there's no love, it's of no use. So same thing. When we are maybe mentoring and ministering to people, we may feel good about ourselves, but if it is not done out of love and care for the person, and again, it just becomes, it may help the person, but then there wouldn't be a fruit. The rewards is something that we want to see that is eternal rewards. Right? So always love is the basis of what you are doing. Remember that each individual is unique. Now, when it comes to mentoring, especially, and I just want to go back to the ministry aspect, right? Um, many times, you know, a person could be, this has happened, right? Where a person could be 15 years in the Lord, very, very knowledgeable in God's word, done a lot of research, gone back, studied, done, you know, history and geography and, uh, you know, gone through these uh, commentaries and, and he or she is very, very well versed with the word of God. Highly intellectual, right? And then there's this, you know, a young boy who's just become a believer, who only knows a few things. Okay, the prodigal of the lost son, Jesus died on the cross. Nothing more. Okay. Now, it's very easy for us to come to a place and say, hey, you know, I'm sure we, you know, not many of them do that, but when it comes to mentoring, it's always be understand that people are at different levels. Each individual is unique. Just because he or she does not know the scriptures in and out doesn't mean that you know they cannot be mentored. Maybe they have a gift of you know playing an instrument or singing, which this other person cannot doesn't have. And this person can say, "Hey, you're a mentor. You don't know how to sing in tune." I'm just giving an example, right? So you must understand that each person is unique. Also, we must understand that people come from different backgrounds, different cultural settings, different understandings, right? Uh, we must understand that, especially in Christianity, there are so many, uh, you know, branches, I would say, or denominations of Christianity, and people come from different understandings. There are people who don't believe in healings, there are people who believe in healings, people who don't believe in the father, they believe only in the son, all kinds of understandings. That's where you come in. Right? And as a mentor, it is very important to speak the truth. And I always say this, it's very easy to point finger and say, hey, this is wrong. There's time for that. But a better thing to do is to speak the truth and let the truth minister. Because the truth is greater than the lie or the, uh, the false words of the enemy. The truth is greater. Right? So always remember, right? Uh, you, you're not, you don't attack the person for his or her understanding. Right? Uh, you know, for example, you know, you, 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 you're mentoring somebody and, and you know, Maybe this person has this habit of removing their shoes and praying. It's okay. You don't have to, we don't have to say, hey, how, why are you removing your shoes? That, that's Moses did that. We don't have to do that. We don't have to. Right? So I, I believe that in Christianity, many a times we, we zoom in or we focus on the minors rather than the majors. Right. We focus on all these other practical things, right? rather than what is more important. What is important to minister the world, to see the person grow in the things of God. And all of these other 
rituals or practices that can be changed even if they don't change it it's all right right when they know the truth the truth will set them free right so understand that when you're ministering to people each individual is unique but when you look at them look at them with the love of god that you are sowing seeds into their lives i love what apostle paul says he says every day i kneel before the father thinking of you he's thinking of all the churches he says i kneel before the father praying for you so you look at that aspect of the apostle paul it was not about okay i have to start another five more churches i have to go for another missionary journey no it was all about people it's all about people in his heart and that's why you're such a great mentor such a great uh, you know ministry that is that even now years thousands of years later we're talking about it right last point we cannot love only on the group scale meaning leave there are three four people in my group i will love all of them you know, mentoring is always you know it is one-on-one -on -one, right it is where you speak into the person's life and they uh, are willing to open up and speak uh, you know what is going what what they are going through and being willing to receive uh the counsel the godly counsel and the word of god into their life. Right? whatever you do you need a blueprint so you need to see the end picture before you are ready to begin this is so important right uh, you see the end picture what is the end picture i see this person standing and ministry to maybe hundreds of people I see this person right now. There's nothing. I mean, he's just still learning about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, but one day I will see him spraying over the sick, and the sick are being healed. One day, oh, you may see a little timid boy who is only 18, 19 years old. But one day I see him driving out demons from people. That's a blueprint you have in your mind. You, you, you picture it. And you work towards that, right? And, and it, it, no matter what, even in our lives, right? You picture what you want to see, right? Remember what Jesus did? Love that picture. So, it, it, you know, I was reading the book of John. It's such a powerful book. Sometimes, you know, we read the scriptures and we just, we just read it. And we say, oh, yeah, I finished reading the book of John. But if you read it, my heart was so moved because after a certain point, the whole, you know, the whole, sorry, I'm digressing a little bit, but the whole, you know, the understanding of Jesus, the whole aspect of taking the sins of the world, that he's not going to be there uh, moving, he's moving out from his place of, uh, you know, he's going to take on sin, he's going to taste death. And he gives this whole long speech. He goes on talking and talking. Very unlike Jesus. Because he knew that this is, is it very emotional when you read the book of John towards the end. Very, very emotional. He just knew that he's going. He knew it. He said, listen, don't be afraid. Don't, don't worry when I'm not there. I'm giving you the Holy Spirit. He will come. Now these disciples had no clue what's happening. But he knew everything. He had the blueprint, he had the picture in his mind. And it's such a powerful book. <laughs> and so when you are developing a person, have a blueprint in your heart, in your mind. Peter saw, Jesus saw Peter, people saw Peter as a fisherman, but Jesus saw him as a leader of a church, not just a small church, thousands of people taking on a ministry to the from one level to another. Everyone saw Peter? He's a fisherman. That's what happened in Acts. Peter and John go to pray. Oh, these unschooled fishermen, how come they're speaking with such knowledge? That's because God already saw it. The Lord Jesus saw this in them. Right? So second point is spiritual fathering. Now when we say fathering and mothering, it is it, it is in a gender independent way, right? Meaning, it is 
uh, a man ministering and mentoring a man, a mother or a woman ministering and uh, you know ministering and mentoring to a mother. And something that we want to do as a church is we always want that to be, you know, God has a few designs, right? And so we want to do it the right way. Okay? The goal in our Christian growth is to go from little children to becoming fathers and mothers. Right? None of us, none of us, I, I and I'm 100% sure that none of us want to be children all our life. Right. And sometimes, you know, I look at my kids and I say, I, I wish I was this because they are on their summer break and all they're doing is play. So sometimes I feel, oh man, I wish I was a kid. They, they have no worries, they have no problems. All they have to do is find a game and play that game. <laughs> but that's not how life is. There's, there'll come a time and uh, they have to grow, they have to make their own decisions. And that's what it is. Christian growth is growing from being little children to becoming fathers and mothers. Now, this is God's design, right? Now, it's not going to—it's not a switch. Right? It's not going to automatically happen. Oh, I put on the switch. Okay, I become from children. I become a father or a mother. No. It involves spending time in the Word of God. You got to go into the Word. You got to. Ask God for wisdom. You've got to, uh, you know, step out of your comfort zone. You've got to make your mistakes, learn from those mistakes, um, you know, go through challenges, go through storms in life, uh, see the things that God has for you. And then you see that this person comes from being a child to becoming a father. And once they become a father, meaning once they're grown up, now you'll have other people coming up to you and saying, hey, you know, I'm going through this challenge, this difficulty. Now you've gone through that mountain, so you're able to minister through that. If you haven't gone through it, how will we be able to you know, minister to it? Right? Now also, I would say, you know, the word. Yes, you, you, know, you just read the word. Maybe sometimes we haven't gone through a situation, but then somebody is sharing their difficulties and challenges, but you have the word. So God can give you the right word and say, hey, this is what the word says. Hold on to the word of God. Right? And when the word of God is there, you hold on, you speak the word of God. God will be able to do his word is alive, his word is powerful. You just declare the word, his word says, uh, you know, when you when the word comes out of your mouth, it will not return void, but it fulfill the purpose for which uh, it has been sent out for. What are you doing? You are speaking into their life. Right? So you and I must be prepared for this. There'll come a time. There'll come a time. I remember I was, I think, 25. When I started, uh, you know, be, you know, preaching 23, 24, somewhere there, and then when I was about 25, I started traveling to many places across India, uh, you know, just just going and preaching. Right, I, I didn't have any big knowledge about God's word and all of that. I just knew, okay, so but I spent a lot of time in the word, but you know, it was most of it I used to preach was from the New Testament and uh, a few stories from the Old Testament. So I didn't really know everything but i remember uh, there was a time when i would preach and people would ridicule me there was this guy coming you know this small boy uh, and i would say if you want prayer please come in front nobody would come nobody would come uh, i would feel so embarrassed and uh, sad and say god what is this not even one person came for prayer uh, sometimes there were times when i used to preach um, I'm talking about uh, sometimes out of uh, uh, you know North India and towns and cities outside of uh, outside of Bangalore, and there were times when uh, I would go to preach. I would open the Bible. People would get up and go uh, because they say, "Who's this guy? He doesn't have any experience." Young guy. Uh, many many times, people have got up and left. Right. Uh, so all of these things will happen, but over time. You know, people started coming. I saw, okay, and I would say, if you want prayer, please come. Suddenly, one person would come for prayer. And then I realized, okay, something, you know, God is, God is working. Right? 
so don't be discouraged, especially when you are going from one level of, of, of maturity to another. Um, remember, it's a season. It takes time to get there. Let God do its work. Right? So I'm so grateful now. You know, I don't have to tell people to come for prayer. They're only coming and asking mm -hmm. for prayer. It takes ten years, uh, right? More than fifteen odd years. Uh, so it it it's something that we need to let God work. And I had to go through a lot of ups and downs, right? A lot of things that I had to go through. A lot of failures. A lot of uh, many times felt like giving up. But I thank God that His Word just just directs our path, right? So don't be in a hurry to be a spiritual father or mother. Just let time, but you've got to do something. You've got to get into the word, you've got to get into God's presence and just learn and read and meditate and, and pray and be there in His presence, right? That additional effort. Okay, the difference between spiritual teachers and spiritual fathers. Now, a spiritual teacher teaches truths, but a spiritual father care for and help the individual. Now, it doesn't mean that a spiritual father will not teach truths. Okay, it's not like this is separate. Spiritual teachers are separate, and spiritual fathers are separate. No, they both. It's just a small difference that we're seeing. Uh, but a spiritual father will also teach truths. That's what uh, you know. Paul says, right? Uh, Timothy is my son. It is obvious that he taught him from God's word, right? A spiritual teacher normally has a formal interaction, but a spiritual father has an informal interaction. And I remember when I was in, uh, you know, when I was in college and Bible college, uh, there was always a formal interaction with the teachers, right? They are my teachers. Uh, and over time, you, you know, you're there, you learn with them slowly it becomes informal right where you're able to speak your speak out you're able to uh, share your thoughts your feelings uh, the challenges that you're going through so uh, a spiritual father it's normally very informal right? now you can't be you know it's like saying can you be formal with your own father at home imagine getting up in the morning good morning dad you know, and you start being very formal. Is it okay if I can sit next to you? I don't say what, what, what's wrong with you, right? Uh, because it's not how it goes. You just go and sit next to him, you have your tea, you talk to him. You don't ask your father, "Can I talk to you right now?" No. You say talk, right? Uh, so it's very different, right? uh, and 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 that fatherhood, that feeling of fatherhood, just comes in there. Now, spiritual teacher has a curriculum specific topics that they talk about, right? But uh, spiritual father speaks about all aspects of life, right? Uh, spiritual teacher learn from his from his teaching, and a spiritual father learn from his life example. And that's why I think Apostle Paul was such a beautiful example. What did he say? Follow me as I follow Christ, and he. he he writes to Timothy, he says, Timothy, you've seen my life. You've seen me. And he tells the church in Ephesus also, in the same letter, he says, you, you know, you follow Timothy because uh, he has followed me. You follow Timothy because he's just like me. He follows my example. Right? So life to life, spirit to spirit. Right? Uh, a spiritual teacher is time for teaching. There's a certain time for teaching, but a spiritual father can teach from any anything in our everyday life. Also, for example, you're going into a supermarket, and then when you get in, you, know, you just buy some things and you come, and then you're upset because the line is long. A spiritual father can teach you patience there. A spiritual teacher may say, just stand in the line. But you, you know, I'm just giving you an example. There's this difference there, right? But a spiritual teacher can be a spiritual father, and a spiritual father can also be a spiritual teacher, right? So in life, more things are caught than taught. And this is so true. You know, I was 
to share what happened to me at home. There was this time when every now and then I would, you know, I would, whenever I'm at home, I would open my laptop and I would be reading and all of these things. But one of the things I've noticed was my children kept saying, hey, you are using the laptop. Uh, so even I want a phone or I want to watch something. And I remember the Lord just ministering to me and saying, if you want him to do something, you, you do it. We knew it, right? That's something that we always teach. Uh, so over time, what I've been doing is I've been, I've not been using my laptop at home. So I, I open my Bible, have a certain few books, then I read and I write and I, uh, not just a show, but this is something that I, uh, I used to do it. But after that, now with all the commentaries that I've made in my life, so I try to, you know, do all the research and study and learn using the laptop. But, uh, but then now I use a book and a pen and I open my Bibles, two Bibles, two, three Bibles, yes. the study. And so now my children said, I want my Bible. And so they sit and they read, right? They don't ask phone or anything. They read and they make notes in their Bibles. And, and it's something that it's caught. Uh, right? it, it, they've seen it. And they follow it. Right? So in life, a lot of things are seen. So as a spiritual father and mother, let your life be an example. What words you and I speak, that's important. But the life example also is very important. Right? So let's look at this few points. All fatherhood flows from God. Ephesians 3, 14 and 15. For this cause, I bow my knee unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. All fatherhood, the nature of God, flows in each of us. Right? The heart of a father is something very instinct. Right? You don't, after a father, you know, after you become a father in the natural, you know, you, you, it's not necessary you have to go and open find two, three books and say how to become a father. You just learn it. I became a father at 26. 26 years old, there was a baby. I had no clue what to do with this baby. What do I do with this baby? I'm not, I don't know anything about fathering. I have no idea. What do I do? Uh, I don't know why he's crying. I don't know. But I didn't read any book. I just knew, as a father, these are some things I have to do. And as a mother, these are some things a mother should do. We just knew it. And it's natural. Right? It's not only me, everyone. The entire world, most of them who are fathers, it, it just inbuilt. It just flows into them. Right? And, and spiritual fathering is an extension of the fatherhood of God. Jesus, uh, you know, so wonderful in the New Testament, he says, look at the birds of the air, look at the sparrows. My Heavenly Father provides for them. Do you think that I will not provide for you? You being earthly fathers, even though you are so evil, you know how when your son provides, when your child asks for food, you don't give them a stone or a snake. How much more will your Heavenly Father provide for you? Remember that fatherhood flows from above into our heart. And then we, in turn, release it to the church in the body of Christ. Secondly, Paul had spiritual sons and daughters. Right? Uh, 2 Timothy 1, 2. To, my, to Timothy, my dearly beloved son. He goes on many places. To Titus, my own son. Right? Uh, Galatians, my little children, whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Remember the Galatians, the first missionary journey, first place where he went? He says, my little children, please don't go back to circumcision. Travail in birth until Christ is formed in you. Right? Thessalonians, the persecuted church. Now, as a, as as you know how we exhorted and comfort and charged every one of you as a father does to his children. Right? Peter considered John Mark to be his spiritual son. 
Now, when we look at this, look at these examples, right? Spiritual sons and daughters cannot be forced on people. You cannot force a person and say, hey, you be my spiritual son. There's no point. There's, you know, it should be out of free will that people want to be ministered from you or by you. Right? So let's see, who is a spiritual father and a mother? Sometimes we mistakenly think that the one who led us to faith is the one who's our spiritual father and mother. But this is not true. Right, look at this in the natural. Anyone can procreate. Right? Baby can be born, but the baby can be put up for adoption. And then this couple can adopt this baby and look after the baby from two months old to 30 years old. Now, when he's 30 years old, the real mother can't come and say, oh, you've become such a wonderful man. So now I am your father or I am your mother. This boy will say, you, you just gave birth to me. That's it. Didn't do anything much. Right? The one who nurtures, brings up the children into maturity, that is the real father and mother. Now, for example, you know, there's somebody I pray for, you know, I'm evangelizing. Give them a track. He says, hey, this is what Jesus did. Can I pray for you? He says, okay. And I pray. I say, God, thank you for this person. And thank you for changing his life, making him a new person. And he does the salvation prayer. And he says, I feel that I've been born again. And he goes away. I don't see him for the next 20 years. And after 20 years, I see him preaching on TV. Does it mean I'm a spiritual father? Not at all. Right? Because when he went away, I didn't see him for 20 years, but the next 20 years, he had some you know, people who ministered into his life, taught him, trained him, built him up to this level of maturity to make him a leader and become a, a pastor or a prophet or whatever. Right? So they are the spiritual father. The father figure movement in certain denominations and organizations uh, have, have caused a lot of problems, right? And, and we must understand the whole aspect of fathering and mothering. A person who, whose teachings you have imbibed through books and tapes may not necessarily be your spiritual father. So for example, if you listen to a person online now with youtube we can connect to any part of the world right we can connect to live services we can we have all the material that is available and so just because i listen to his videos and read his books doesn't mean that he's your spiritual father right because he's sitting in another country he doesn't even know you he's made those videos available He's not speaking into your life. His books, his tapes are speaking. But hes it's only going to help him to a certain limit. A true spiritual father and mother is one who raises up another person from immaturity to maturity. So I'm not saying that watching videos and uh, learning, uh, you know, watching sermons online, reading books of... Uh, Wonderful men and women of God is not important. They are all important, but that cannot make them your spiritual father and mother. Right? Spiritual father and mother is there with you to help you. You know, if, for example, if if there's if you say that somebody in another country is your spiritual father and mother, and here we may be in another country and saying, I'm not able to pray. We can't call him up and ask him how to pray. We say, who are you first? And uh, it, it just doesn't work that way. But a spiritual father and mother who's there, you say, hey, I can't pray. I'm feeling very weak. This person will say, hey, don't worry. Just pray in tongues for maybe 10 minutes. Or just uh, read the word for 10 minutes. Take this one verse and pray. It will help you pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to put a word in your mouth or put a word in your spirit and be able to pray. That is more fruitful 
then a one hour sermon on how to pray. Right? So we understand that difference. <laughs> Characteristics of a spiritual father and mother. Judges 5, 7 through 9. The inhabitants of the villages ceased. They ceased in Israel until I, Deborah, arose. And I arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then was war in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart is towards the governors of Israel that offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless ye the Lord. The book of Judges is, uh, I know I, I know that most of us have you know gone through this book. It, it's a book where you know things just start to crumble for the nation of Israel. And things are just falling apart. They chose, they forgot. Because Deuteronomy was a reminder. That reminder is something that they did not apply in their lives. And judges, we see that uh, they wanted a new leader, they wanted a king. Uh, the people of Israel were against God, uh, he was living in a, a life of sin. Uh, but let's look at what a true spiritual father and mother is. Let's try and do this. A true spiritual father and mother is one who's involved in the life of his spiritual son and daughter. Keyword involved. One who's able to correct, rebuke, discipline, and guide. Look at these three keywords. Correct, rebuke, discipline, and guide. So, right? uh, they are able to pass the surface and instruct the inner man. Right? So they're able to speak into your lives. Say, hey, you got to wake up. you got to spend time. Did you read your word? What did you read? Right? Uh, did you? Uh, what did God minister to you today? While praying, did you sense anything that God is speaking to you about? Uh, or, you know, I, I see that this is some area that we are you are lacking behind. So why don't you, you know, spend more time in worship? Uh, he's able to correct, rebuke, discipline. And he's also able to guide you. A spiritual leader is one who goes beyond casual relationships to a more meaningful relationship. And there's accountability for growth, conduct, and ministry. Right? So the casual relationship of a spiritual father is very important. We looked at that, right? It's very casual. But it doesn't end there. It goes from there to a more meaningful relationship. Right? Uh, it is uh, a spiritual father or mother deals with your character more than your gifting. Very, very important. Gifting will be there. We grow in those gifts, but character is what is important. Character is what will keep you strong in the ministry. It has a true and sincere heart in building you as a person and not just using your gift. A gift is given from heaven. Paul says uh, the gifts are irrevocable. It's given to us. But character is something that is built here on earth. Through perseverance, it's built on it. One who is who does not mind that a spiritual son and daughter exceeds and goes beyond them. Uh, a true spiritual father or mother will not be like Saul, who became jealous of David's accomplishment. Uh, let me just finish these two points, and if there's a question, I'll just uh, answer that. Uh, number six. Okay, so. A, a true spiritual father will not be like Saul. And we've mentioned this before. What if Saul was good and he was able to you know, mentor David and get him onto the throne? Things would have been different. Uh, one who rescues you from a place of abandonment and gives you a spiritual home. One who sees that you understand, sees and understands your future and trains you for it and releases you at the right time. Right? So there are all of these aspects. Uh, what we'll do is next class, we'll go into lessons from Paul and Timothy's relationship. Right? Is there a question here? Uh, has anybody asked a question? Okay, Rosalind. Uh, uh, just a thought and question to who is the spiritual father of Apostle Paul? Okay. After the Apostle Paul became a believer, we see that he was there for about 15 days in Jerusalem. And after that, he went into Arabia. He was there for about three years in Arabia. But we don't know about 
who he was with, right? Uh, so if you see the scriptures, he says, what I received from the Lord, I give to you. So Peter did not mentor him, John, none of the disciples. He himself says it, Paul says it. Uh, I was, none of them were there with me. None of the great apostles were with the Lord Jesus were there with me. So none of them were there. And then those three years, he, you know, he talks about being caught up in the heavens. Mostly happened in those three years, right? He talks about what I received from the Lord, I give to you the night the Lord Jesus was betrayed. So those three years in the in the desert was the years of his learning. And most of his learning happened directly from the Lord, right? And then he went into Tarsus and he was there for 14 years in Tarsus. Now, these are called the silent years of Apostle Paul. We don't know who, what... We know that he did a little bit of ministry, but there's no account of what ministry he did, right? So to answer your question, Rosalind, Apostle Paul most likely didn't have a spiritual father and mother, but what he received was he received direct revelations from the Lord, and he was able to, through the wisdom of God, he was able to apply it in his life. And we see the wisdom of God in all his letters to the churches as well. So, um, so that's what I would say. He didn't really have a spiritual father. Again, it's not necessary. We must have a spiritual father or a spiritual mother. Right? It's not necessary. It's not like if we don't have a spiritual father or mother, we'll not go to heaven. <laughs> yes, it is possible to be without a spiritual father. No problem. You have the word of God. The word of God will teach you. But in that way, don't... Don't be in a place where I don't want a spiritual father and mother, right? I say, I don't want, no. I'll be open to how the Lord may bring in people into your life. Uh, but again, you you see how it is for you, right? Whether you're able to you know, be ministered to and there's a level of uh, comfort and the relationship is uh, mutual, then you can go on, right? Uh, otherwise, it's not really necessary. Okay, uh, but it's good to have a spiritual father or a spiritual mother. They can speak into your life. All right, so let's stop here. We'll continue from next class. Uh, a few aspects on this uh, mentoring, and then okay. thank you so much. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Have a good week ahead.